Go to Hebrews 11, if you've got your Bible. Hebrews 11, verse 13. We're going to go to there. Strangers and pilgrims. Strangers and pilgrims. And the writer to the Hebrews, presuming it's Paul, talks about God's heroes. And we take it up from Hebrews 11, verse 13, where it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, says, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Hebrews 11, 13, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So here we see God's heroes. A list in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, the record of the heroes of the faith, and God's heroes are the people, it says, as reads here, they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They're people seeking for another country. They confess, it says, that we are strangers and pilgrims here. They confessed it. And we likewise, we could consider that we're marching in their tread. We're in their footsteps. We're in their steps, marching with them in the same confession of faith. They confessed we are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And we likewise do so. We confess through word, lifestyle, through our way of life, we seek a country and we are strangers and pilgrims for the meantime. They declare, they confess, we seek a country. Are you seeking it? Are you searching for it? Are you looking for it? Are you living for it, for that country, for that country? We know our Lord Jesus promised in John 14, verse 3, that his disciples, he tells them that he was going away and that he was leaving this old world, this planet, and that he was going somewhere out there to prepare a place, to prepare a place for them. And if I go and prepare a place for you, he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And of course he goes on to explain the way is himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, seeking this evening to communicate this theme, strangers and pilgrims. What does that mean? And how should we translate that into our own lives? The fact is, we're really and truly just passing through. We're just passing through. We're sojourners, we're strangers, we're aliens. We're uh, pilgrims. We're just passing through down here. I like to think of it as some might have taken some travel here and there to different countries perhaps, and it's almost like this is just a stopover. Who's ever had that? Like a stopover, you're just there for a day or two on the journey to your real destination. This is, in a kind of a way, this is like a stopover. It's not our destination. It's just not our true home that is yet to come that country, that land, that place, that real destination. And we belong to that place. We're speaking of heaven, of course. That place that the Lord Jesus, he says, he is preparing for us. And it's a country far beyond our imagination. As we read of it, as Paul touches on it in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor hath the ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So our true home, in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, it says it is eternal in the heavens. That's, it's not going to be, uh, uh, you don't have to worry about insurance for that one, if there's hail damage or whatever. You don't have to worry about any damaged, because it's not going to be damaged, it's eternal in the heavens. You don't have to worry about getting a building inspector or uh, have the council assess it and approve it because it might crack up one day. No, this building that is yet to come, this heavenly home, it is eternal in the heavens, our true home. And for the meantime, we're just pilgrims and strangers here. It's got that sense that we can hang on to God's promises for the future home, that true, eternal future home of heaven. And you, brothers and sisters here tonight, you, our fellow believers, Fellow Christians, you're meant to be a stranger. Do you realise that? Realise that? Do you get that? Do you live like that? Now, some Christians are stranger than other Christians. 
But in a good way, I want to be a pilgrim and a stranger down here, don't you? To be a pilgrim and a stranger, to have that sense that, well, this is just a passing through, a preparation, a kind of holding place for that eternal home that we are preparing for. And the preachers from God's word here in Hebrews are telling us that God's people are supposed to be strangers and pilgrims. So what does it mean? Paul uses a word here for stranger that means foreigner, an alien, uh, one who is different, a foreigner. Now, I could think back to me as a young lad uh, of eight and a half and arrived on these shores from, from the fair motherland of uh, England and uh, it was a, quite a strange experience for me. I was a foreigner here and uh, I can remember being in the Pennington Hostel as a young lad, eight and a half, uh, and uh, someone introduced me to an Aussie rules football. And I thought there was something wrong with that ball. I've never seen a ball like that before. I'm used to these round balls called soccer balls. And, uh, you know, and when they gave me this footy, this Aussie rules football, I didn't even know what to do with it, how to kick it or how to hold it. I still don't, but uh, uh, you know, there's that sense where I was a stranger here. Uh, in a way, I still am. You know, but uh, I'm a foreigner here in a sense, and that's the sense of it here, that we as godly people are kind of just temporarily here in this strange land, uh, in this strange planet, and we're foreigners here. We don't have to conform. We don't have to fit in and follow suit with a godless culture. You know, I've been corrupted uh, since I was here as a young lad. My, my uh, language has been corrupted. I talk a lot more like an Aussie now. Uh, you know, I lost the, that perfect, uh, pristine, perfect... Uh, Mother England tongue, you know, the, how English is really supposed to be talked, and now I talk in an Aussie, you know, this corrupted Australian accent. And so, you know, there's that sense where we are strangers, we don't have to conform to this world. You know, there's that sense as, as a young lad, I had to conform, otherwise I'd get teased like mad. But we don't have to conform to this world, we don't have to fit in and follow suit with this world, because we've got a culture that is of God. We've got a godly culture in living in a godless land, a godless culture. So in saying that, I'm saying don't be afraid to be different. You don't have to conform. In fact, the Bible tells us not to conform. Now, let's rather be strangers. Let's be pilgrims. Let's not be afraid to be different. Peter uses a word for stranger, a different word. That means a foreigner, one who lives in a place without the right of citizenship. So it's got that sense, that strict sense where... We actually don't have citizenship here. Uh, it's, we are a foreigner uh, who's in, that, in that, that sense of not being a citizen, not having a right of citizenship. So a Christian is a stranger in this world, a foreigner, a foreigner, and a misfit in this society, a nonconformist. And we, as God's people, we don't fit in with this culture uh, because, let's face it, the culture of the world is sin and sinfulness. The value system of this world is so different for us who believe this world, the, the language of the world, the thinking of the world, the loyalties of the world. In my experience, I've found, sadly, some who profess Christ but yet want to keep their feet in the world uh, make, make a real mess of it. Uh, they tend to ham it up. You know, they, they don't grow as Christians because they've still got that tie they're tied to the world and the worldly ideas and they never grow uh, as strong and as uh, wholesome as they could do for Christ. They're not as fruitful for Christ because they're hanging on to such things as the worldly music or worldly loves or just the worldly ways, worldly mindset. They've never made the break from it and that can be a real, they can be hamstrung in their Christian life and they end up as weak as water. You know, don't be afraid to be different, people here tonight. Don't be afraid to be a stranger for God, a pilgrim for God in this world. Don't be afraid to be different. We see uh, Hebrews 11 tells us about some such Bible characters, Bible strangers, if you like, Bible strangers. Now, just reflecting further on this theme of strangers in a foreign land, strangers in a foreign land. I can remember as a young lad, um, we went back to England for a time and had a stopover in Hong Kong. And I can remember going to Hong Kong. It's a, I know it's, it means a lot to Julia, Hong Kong, of course. But I had a little stopover as a young lad. Maybe I was about 15 or something 
in Hong Kong. And I can remember getting out of the plane and walking down the streets of Hong Kong and everything was written in Chinese. And it just was just mind-blowing. Just couldn't get my head around it. It just was so strange for me. It was so confronting for me. And to think, I'm a stranger here. You know, everybody looks different for me. Uh, that everything looks different. All the Chinese, you know, the Chinese characters on all the signage. And it was very confronting for me to be a stranger in a foreign land. And that should be the kind of mindset we should have in the sense that we don't have to conform to this world. All right. So we see some examples of Bible strangers here in Hebrews 11. Number one, we see Noah. Noah, you could say, see that he was a stranger in the land. He was a misfit, not because he built a boat in the middle of nowhere, but he preached and practiced righteousness in a perverted culture. <coughs> Noah. Now the world will put up with unconventional people so long as they don't hassle them about their sinful lifestyle. Noah was willing to be different. Noah was willing to be outspoken. Noah was willing to stand out from the crowd. In Hebrews 11 verse 7 we see, and notice what made a difference to make him a pilgrim or a stranger was by faith. By faith, the recurring phrase, by faith. That's what made the Hebrews 11 people different. That's what made them strangers and pilgrims. Noah, by faith, it says, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, it says, you know, the fear, the wrath of God, the, the reverence of God, moved with that sensitivity to God. He was moved with that, and it says he prepared an ark to the saving of his household, uh, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So here it says Noah uh, condemned the world. He prepared an ark. He was moved with fear, and he became an heir of righteousness, which is by faith, by faith again. Noah, it says in 2 Peter 2 verse 5, he was called a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. And, and so we see, are we a stranger like Noah? Think of that. That's pretty radical, isn't it? To think that concept. We're walking in Noah's footsteps. We're walking in that same journey of faith. By faith, we are ought to be like Noah. Are we a stranger like Noah? Do we see the things to come? Do we see the things that are to come? Do we preach and practice righteousness, even if it makes us misfits in this world? We read on in the faith chapter of Hebrews 11, of these faith heroes in Hebrews 11. You could read from verse 32. We're not going to touch on every uh, element here. But it says of these ones in Hebrews 11, from verse 32 to 40, it says that these ones, they saw the promises of God. They journeyed forward by faith. They held loosely to this world. They held firmly to the promises. They confessed, it says, confessed, it says, that they were strangers and pilgrims, just travellers in the earth. Hebrews 11, verse 13. So these were people who were looking for something better. They said, this is not our country. This world is not our permanent home. This is not the place where we are at home. We do not belong here. Here we have no continuing city, it says. Hebrews 13, 14, but we seek one to come. Do you confess that? Do you declare, Australia is not my country. This world is not my world. The Bible calls this world warped, twisted, perverted, this present evil world. And what's more, it's governed by the devil. The God of this world is one of his titles in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. So the God of this world is the devil. And it says of those who are in his uh, train that in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So we are God's strangers. We are, as God's church, we are strangers. We're not part of this system. We're actually counter cultural. We're, we counter this system, this world system. We're not a part of it. And it's, you know, just trying to grasp that concept can really help us to, to really steer a course that is different and not be afraid to be steering a course of your life that is different from the world around. And our Lord says as he prayed for the church, for us, as he had in, in foresight, it says, I have given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world. Not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, 
but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. I mean, the Lord Jesus himself, he was the ultimate stranger. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He was despised and rejected of men. We need to walk in his tread and have that same mindset that we will follow Christ. He is that ultimate one and we are in his company. We are willing to be estranged from the world. We are not of this world. Our identity is not based on this world. Our culture is not based on this world system. Our way of life, our lifestyle, it's not based on this world, but it is based on heaven, heaven to come. So friends, I urge you tonight to consider, are you on this quest? Are you on that journey to look for that better place, that better place, that better home awaiting, looking for the Saviour's grace, looking for the Master's face, looking for that better place? Our permanent abode is not here. Australia is just temporary. You know, we've got the politicians trying to save the planet at the moment. Look, uh, it's, it's uh, without sounding like uh, you're dismissing, uh, dismissive of trying to be a good uh, steward of this planet, really climate change, whatever, uh, they, they can't save the planet by man's effort or intent because ultimately it's all going to go up in smoke. Australia is just temporary, just passing, it's just short term. We're looking for a city, we're looking for a country, we're looking for a place, and that is our forever home. Uh, that is uh, eternal in the heavens. And God is eventually going to pull the plug on planet Earth. Now, man can't save the planet, uh, whether it needs saving uh, environmentally is another question, but man can't do anything to save the planet. The only one who can save the planet is the saviour. Uh, as far as what the ultimate problem is, is the fall of man. That's the problem with planet Earth, that it is fallen. It's a fallen planet. And Australia is not going to go on forever. So uh, let's not put our stakes down too deep in this Earth of Australia. Paul said we should no longer walk uh, as the other Gentiles. God has changed our mind, our understanding, our heart. We read in Ephesians 4, as he writes from verse 17, he says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, which means excess, sensuality, They've given themselves over, they've given themselves up to, to sinful conduct, to work all uncleanness with greediness. So there's lots of pictures there being alienated from the life of God, being uh, in ignorance, being in blindness, blindness of heart, uh, lacking that understanding, the understanding being darkened. You, know, you don't want to be there, people. You don't want to be amongst that. You don't want to be of that, of that world, but of the life of God. Some are estranged from the life of God. They're in darkness. They're, in, they're doomed and they're blinded. But we, God helping us by faith, we that trust him, that know him, we are not estranged from God, but the opposite. We're near to God. We're near to the very heart of God. We're held in his keeping. We're in his closeness, in that proximity, in that very close nearness to him. And that is the picture for us, that we are not estranged, as in divorced from, separated from, far from, but we are close to, we are brought near, we are close to God. Yet we're living, let's face it, people, tonight, we're living in a world full of blind people. Think of that. They're, they're actually blind. They're blind people that cannot see. They cannot truly see. In a world where most people, their understanding is darkened. It's darkened. There's like this big cloud over their understanding and they've shut out the light. They don't even realise that they don't have the light. Our true home is yet to be revealed. Sometime in the future, for the meantime, we are unusual to this world. Think of it, friends. You are unusual. Now, of course, we know some would um, label and, and, and mock uh, churches where they're a bit different. They don't conform to the world's pattern and of course we know some might be a little cult-like in how they might might manifest that but nevertheless they're willing and they're willing to be counted different they're willing to be counted strange 
And, you know, the world would look, and we, we've had comments such that, oh, you're a, you're a bit of a strange church. You know, <laughs> the people think, you know, a church that might, actually, we actually believe the book. We try to live godly. We try to exhort people to truth that we are strange. You know, we, we, we don't, oh, you're not like the world. You don't have the same worldly gimmicks and, and methods and such. And we don't mind confessing that we are non-conformist. We don't mind confessing that we are not conformist, that we might be unusual. We might even be called abnormal uh, or countercultural. as I say. that There's that sense where, actually, we, we don't mind because we confess that we're strangers and pilgrims. We're not ashamed of that. We confess that we belong to Christ and we, we confess that we belong to that one, the stranger who was despised and rejected. So in a world full of blind people, we that can see, we want to reach the ones that are blind. When we truly see, we won't want blindness. We won't want that. Why would we want to go back to blindness? You that see, you that have truly seen now, your eyes have been opened. Why would anyone who is saved want to go back to blindness? Because now they can see. Why, the, why would you want to go back? You that know, that know the, the knowledge of God, why would you want to go back to ignorance? It doesn't make sense, does it, that anyone would even contemplate taking such a course. And, and yet temptation will face us and we must be on guard. It's an interesting kind of analogy that apparently in North Africa there's a tree that's called the lotus tree. And there's a fable about the lotus tree, apparently, that if strangers eat of its fruit, it makes them forget their home. The fruit of the lotus tree of sin and its pleasures has potentially can make people forget their heavenly home. So we don't want to... We don't want to forget our heavenly home. We don't want to forget or forsake our heavenly um, identity, our being strangers and pilgrims. We need to be, beware, as it were, of the lotus tree, you know, that kind of fruit that would make us forget our walk with God. But Noah was such that he was a stranger. And another Bible hero, another stranger, is Moses. Moses, we, we read about Moses. Of course, we know of Moses. Uh, he was that... A uh, babe in the bulrushes uh, as his mother protected him and, and basically he was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter. And yet as he grew to manhood, we see of him that he was not afraid to confess that he was a stranger and a pilgrim. It tells of Moses that he was choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He refused to partake of the evil world the evil fruit of the world of the pleasures of sin. And it reads on, as we read of this stranger who was Moses, it says he was esteeming, he was counting it uh, a value, he was, he was honouring that reproach of Christ, uh, greater riches than all the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect with recon unto the recompense of the reward. In other words, he, he focused on that reward. He knew that he had a reward, a promise of God, of course the promised land. But he knew the cost, the reproach uh, of, the, uh, of Christ. It was a, a deliberate price that he paid, that he forsook the treasures of Egypt and he trusted Christ. He was willing to stand with God's people. And he wasn't ashamed to stand for the Lord, to stand with God's people. He would rather belong to God's people, the people of God, and focus on that reward uh, of the promises of God. And so we should stand up with the people of God. We think down through history. You know, read church history and you see the, the, um, the primitive church, the apostolic church, the early church, the, the remnant church, the faithful church down through history. Of course, we see lots of deviations and aberrant um, beliefs and doctrines, but by and large, right through the, the trail of the, of the church of God through history, there is a remnant, a faithful remnant right through history. Uh, through the church history. And you see, those that were willing to stand up and be counted, people like, for example, the Puritans, you know, those that were saved amongst the Puritans, they were standing for, for righteousness and truth and holiness. They were forthright in standing for the word of God as their governance of their land, of their laws. The Puritans were a, an example. And we know, you know, amongst the Amish, there would be some who were saved, the Mennonites. There would be some amongst them who were saved people. That they took the word of God seriously, that they were willing to be mocked and scorned and laughed at, derided, and, you know, 
dressing different, looking different, talking different. Of course, we know that some amongst them may not have been saved, but there's that element where they were willing to stand up and be strangers, to be strangers and pilgrims. And there's a sense, I think, for us today to have that same mindset. We're willing to be counted um, as unusual, not normal. Uh, we, we're willing to be counted extreme, maybe, if it be so. Uh, if the world counts it extreme to actually believe in a saviour, to believe in a book that tells of a heavenly home, of uh, eternal life, of the heart change that Christ can effect, then we don't, we're not ashamed to be counted uh, different, to be counted strangers. We see another Bible hero was Abraham. Abraham was another stranger, if you like. It says of Abraham, Hebrews 11, verse 10, it says he looked for a city, he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And Hebrews 11, 16 talks about believers who desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So all of these people, Hebrews 11, these people, they kind of stood out from the crowd. They stood out from the, um, the world. They were willing to be counted strangers and pilgrims. Noah, Moses, Abraham. We could think of Daniel and his three friends. They were strangers. They were strangers in Babylon. They were, they were in Babel, but not of Babel. And it's the same for us. You know, as the government of the day ordered them to bow, they knew that they could not bow because they were strangers and pilgrims. Their, their allegiance was foremost and uppermost to the Lord, their God. And Nebuchadnezzar tried to indoctrinate them. He tried to Babylonize them, if you like. They, they had three years of intensive training to become a Babylonian in their mindset, in their thinking, in their culture, in their lifestyle. Uh, but as much as Nebuchadnezzar tried to indoctrinate them, now, they said, we're going to be strangers. We're not going to bow down to that golden image. You know, they were respectful how they put it, but not, they said, we're not going to compromise our conscience, our faith, our trust in God. And so they were different. They were strangers and pilgrims, and so should we be. Don't be afraid to be different. Don't be afraid to stand up for Christ. And that can happen in the workplace, in the home place, in your everyday place, that the, when the rubber hits the road and you've got to stand up and be counted then you will stand for Christ. You will stand for the right. They were different from the crowd. The country they desired was a heavenly one. And so they, God was not ashamed to call them their God. And they weren't ashamed to call God their God, if you like. Be not ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of Christ, of his words. God is preparing a city and we are the people he's preparing for that city. Peter talks along similar lines to Paul in uh, 1 Peter 2. We read verse 11. Verse 12, it says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I appeal to you, he says, as strangers and pilgrims. He's saying, I'm appealing to you, strangers, pilgrims, I'm calling you. Abstain, he says, from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Having a conversation, in other words, your way of life, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. So let's look at Peter's message. He's saying here, he's addressing the people of God. He's saying you're strangers and pilgrims, and as such, abstain from the fleshly lusts. Peter urges us to be strangers. In other words, foreigners, aliens, and pilgrims, if you like, refugees. Uh, pilgrims, we're misfits. We're travelling through, we're travellers. We're only travellers. We're only visitors here in Australia. Let's not get so um, wrapped up in... Um, the Aussie kind of culture where it's godless, but rather to stand for truth. Because we are a holy nation, a peculiar people, God's own special people. It says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, peculiar, it's got the sense we're special. We're especially in God's, uh, in God's calling. Well, we are called to be that special, God's own special people. And we're strangers and pilgrims, verse 11, and we are called the righteous 1 Peter 4, verse 18. 1 Peter 2, verse 10, we call the people of God. So today's Christians, people here tonight, are we truly confessing that we're strangers and pilgrims? Don't be afraid to confess, I'm a Christian. Don't be afraid to confess, I'm a stranger and a pilgrim. 
Peter cries out to believers from his heart. He says, abstain from fleshly lusts. Abstain means hold yourself back from. Continually hold yourself back from is the sense of it. And Paul lists the works of the flesh. Again, we could list them here in Galatians 5. In contrast to the fruit of the spirit, the works of the flesh are manifest, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, which is that kind of sensuality, um, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So here you see a whole long list of fleshly things, sexual sins, fornication, sins of the emotions, hatred, outbursts of wrath, Jealousies, envy. Paul's telling us here these are the works of the flesh and we, uh, Peter says, abstain from uh, such. Abstain from it. They war against the soul. When, it says, when Peter says abstain from, it's got the sense of hold ourselves constantly back from. It's kind of a constant thing because it hits you from here, there and everywhere through life. As a Christian, as you grow, you're going to have the fleshly lusts. It's constant bombardment. And so it, Paul, Peter's saying, abstain, hold yourselves constantly back from. Have that constant mindset, reinforcing it, continuing in that abstaining from. Why? Because such things war against the soul. So we're on a spiritual pilgrimage. And the world that we live in, let's face it, uh, these things that we just read through in Galatians 5, 20, 21, that's what the world's all about, isn't it? That's what uh, generally some of this stuff here in Galatians 5, just to just f- look at that list there. It's, it's modern movies, isn't it? It's uh, modern music. Uh, the world's trash. It's filled with such things. Worldly thinking, all of those things. It's all the world and the things of the world. It's interesting, um, apparently in uh, Corinth, you know, the church of Corinth, had uh, a lot of attacks like this. There was very many fleshly temptations and, and, and troubles in Corinth, the church at Corinth. And apparently there was a saying in Corinth uh, that well, there was such a thing as to live a Corinthian life. To live a Corinthian life. In other words, it, it was, Corinth was known as being a pr- pretty fleshly, um, godless unspiritual place, a Corinthian life. We could think uh, of really the, the godless Aussie kind of life, couldn't we? The godless Aussie life. And you know, for some, um, that's all they know. That's, all, that's, that's life to them. Life is, you know, um, work hard, drink hard, party hard, or, you know, what the, the kind of slogans people come up with, isn't it? The worldly slogans or, you know, it's almost like, that they wait for the weekend to get paralytic, to get, you know, to get sloshed, to get stoned, to get off their face, as if that's somehow some... They've arrived when they've reached that point of their ecstasy, that they're, they've reached such ecstasy that they're spewing in the gutter. And that's the, that's the ultimate high of the Aussie culture of our day, isn't it? Let's face it. I'm talking a bit crass here, but that's how people think, isn't it? That's how the worldly culture thinks, that they want to wait till the happy hour so-called when they get sloshed and they, they glug, glug, glug uh, to, to blow away their minds from all their, all their worries as if that's some kind of solve-all but really it's vanity, it's a waste of a life. It's, it, that's the world and the things of the world. We want to abstain from all of that and to mind rather the things of the spirit. And Peter urges, he says, having a conversation honest among the Gentiles. So th- this word honest, it means honourable. 1 Peter 2, verse 12, having a conversation, in other words, your way of life, honest among the Gentiles. What he's talking about is being honourable. Now, we as God's people, we should be honourable because we represent, as the strangers and pilgrims, we represent the ultimate stranger. We represent the ultimate, our Lord who we walk after, the one who's ultimately honourable, the one who is most full of honour and decency and, and that which is righteous and true. That which is most beautiful is our precious Lord. We want to live a life that is honourable among the Gentiles. So in the sense of those that don't know God, 
We should live honourably, friends. We should have honourable conduct. We see even... Yeah, it's kind of ironic these days, isn't it, when you hear of some disgraced footy player. You know, a disgraced football player has had an affair with someone or other and, and so he's been disgraced. Even the world's got a conduct. Even the world's got a level, a standard of conduct, a standard of, of a living that they would say that's conduct unbecoming. That's conduct dishonourable. Even the world has got a sense that's wrong. There is a right and a wrong. And they'll condemn them. They'll put them on the front page of the advertiser and condemn them. Or even, you know, these, as we know, the New South Wales Premier and accusations that are being thrown around uh, that, that there's a potential that she could be found of doing something dishonourable. Even the world's got a level of what is dishonourable and what is honourable. How much more for we, the strangers and pilgrims, how much more for you that you ought to live as having an honourable conduct, having your conversation, your way of life, honest or honourable among the Gentiles. Think of how you live, how you conduct yourself. If they've got, if they've got such high standards for footy players, what about we, the people of God? What sort of, not saying we're uh, saving ourselves by our works or by being good or doing good works, we're more, um, we're more saved than someone who's not, but it's that sense where we, because we love our Lord, honourable conduct, conduct that's becoming of a Christian, it ought to be our aspiration because we want to glorify our God. Let's face it, we want to live like we're citizens of heaven. Amen? Can you get that? That we want to live like, yes, we are citizens of heaven. And even more so, we're ambassadors. And it makes you wonder, as you know, um, yeah, it's one of the kind of high offices in government is to be an ambassador of the nation. And they've got pretty high standards for ambassadors. Uh, how much more for we that are ambassadors of the kingdom of God? We're strangers and pilgrims. We're representatives of heaven. So we ought to have conduct that is becoming. And let's not get ourselves so wrapped up in this world, too comfortable, too attached to this old world, but rather consider that our citizenship... Uh, as we read Revelation 3, verse 20, our conversation, or you could put it, our citizenship is in heaven, where we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus, who's going to transform our vile body. Citizenship for us is heavenly. That's, that's, our, that's our ultimate citizenship. You know, you might, I've got dual citizenship of UK and Australia, but really got a triple citizenship. <laughs> Amen? Because my citizenship is in heaven. And you that believe, you that are Aussies, you might just have your citizenship as an Australian, but if you're a safe person, you've got a, you've got a dual citizenship because your citizenship, your, your conversation, your citizenship is in heaven. So we're friends, friends, we're foreigners on this earth. And if just capture that. Just, just, just grasp that. In some measure, I, I pray tonight, we're called to pass the time of our sojourning in other words, our kind of travelling through in fear. That's 1 Peter 1, verse 17. We're called to pass the time of our sojourning, our travelling through in fear. In other words, live reverently. Live in the fear of God. And this, this short time span, this short lifespan, this, this vapour, this, this uh, puff of, of the life that we live, that's here one minute and gone the next, uh, we, let's make it count for an eternity. And be willing to be a stranger don't be afraid to be a Christian. Don't be afraid to talk different, to look different, to think different, to act different, to be different. Paul says we're citizens of heaven. And, and friends, citizens have rights and privileges, but they also have responsibilities. Think of it. You know, some people, they, they want to be an Australian citizen, and it gives them all sorts of rights and privileges, but they've also got responsibilities to, to act according to that citizenship. And what about you and me that, that trust Christ, that we're born from heaven, we're born from above, we're born again. Our home is not here beneath, but it is there above. And it tells us we seek a better country. It's better. It's better than Australia. You might think Australia is a fair land, but friends, this country yet to come is far better, far better. And someone said, if God made this world so fair, where sin and death abound, how beautiful beyond compare will paradise be found. You know, think of all the beauties of uh, you know, lovely gardens and scenery and landscapes and, and 
and beautiful places you could visit on this planet, heaven is far better, far better, a better country. And we desire to be at home there in heaven. So just hang on. We've still got a bit longer to go, but soon we'll all be there that trust him. We'll all be reunited. We that love the Lord and know him, it tells us that we will be together. But for the meantime, we've got some work to do. We've got some, we've got some actions to take. We've got some activities to fulfill. It tells us that our treasure is in heaven, um, that we're not of this world. It tells us that we're pilgrims, we're travellers, just visiting planet Earth for a time, for a season. And when we're on a journey... We're on our way to the destination. So let's not get overly caught up with all the sights along the way. You know, sometimes uh, as we're travelling through, that we've got to have the mind that our destination is heaven. We're, we're, uh, we're just, let's not get caught up in all the sights along the way that we miss the point of our life is heaven, to live heavenly. And we've got a different driving force from the world around us. That's why we're strange. The, the world around you has a different driving force. They're, they're driven by riches, by pleasure, by vanities. Here's what J.C. Ryler, an old-time faithful man, preached. He said, The world is an enemy to the Christian soul, and there is an utter opposition between the friendship of the world and the friendship of Christ. We're strange. We're, we're in, in some ways, we're opposite. We're, there's, in a way, there's a kind of hostility, uh, an enmity between the world and the faithful Christian, because the world and its ways should have no draw upon us. The world's people can only see and sense the things of earth. We know the familiar scripture, Romans 12, be not conformed to this world. You're a stranger here. You're a pilgrim here. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So friends, just to Come to a drawing this to a close now. Be a stranger. Be a pilgrim. Don't be, don't be afraid to confess that you're a stranger and a pilgrim. And don't settle for the things of earth. These are temporary. These will not last. Seek that which is eternal. Desire it. Tread that holy heavenward path. Be willing to have honourable conduct that is fitting for you that are the saved, the sons and daughters of the living God ambassadors for the kingdom of God. He who would valiant be against all disaster, let him in constancy follow the master. There's no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. Whoso beset him round with dismal stories do but themselves confound his strength the more is. No foe shall stay his might though he with giants fight. He will make good his right to be a pilgrim. Since, Lord, thou dost defend us with thy spirit, we know we at the end shall life inherit. Then fancies flee away. I'll fear not what men say. I'll labour night and day to be a pilgrim. Now these are truths we can take heart in today, I trust, and put into action. Just to wrap up with one little further comment, and the writer of that, those verses I read, is... John Bunyan, and John Bunyan, he was one of the faithful Puritans of old England. You know, the Puritans went to America, numbers of them. John Bunyan was a Puritan, uh, uh, an old-time Baptist of, of the day, uh, who stayed in England, and he was in prison simply for being a nonconformist. He was a stranger and a pilgrim. He didn't go along with the establishment church of the day. You know, they, they wanted him to conform to some rules and regulations about fitting in with the, I guess, the Anglican church of the day, that they had precise directions of the government of the time and you had to be accredited by the bishops and whatnot. But he said, no, I'm, I'm just going to be a faithful Bible preacher. I'm just going to preach as God has called me to preach to the little flock that he had. And he was faithful in that. And for that, he was in prison for more than 15 years. Fancy that. He did no crime. All he simply did was preach the gospel as God had called him to preach it and not to be a conformist, but to be a non-conformist. He was willing to be a stranger and a pilgrim. And he wrote that famous book, Pilgrim's Progress. And just a little quote here about one of the accounts. And Pilgrim's Progress is a lovely book and you do well to, to search it out and have a read of Pilgrim's Progress. There's much you can learn from it. 
It's a telling story that, that illustrates truth. And we read about a couple of the pilgrims, or Christian and faithful, they visited a place called Vanity Fair in the town Vanity. So it's kind of a picture of the pilgrims, these two, going into a, a worldly kind of setting. And so here they were in the Vanity Fair where there's all this, you know, all of this hoo-ha going on, all of this, you know, showy, uh, sensual, fleshly entertainment and such in the town of Vanity. And they looked upon these two, Christian and faithful, as strangers. And these two pilgrims are on the way to the celestial city, which means heaven. Uh, they stood out as different. Okay, I'm kind of paraphrasing a bit because there's some old English words here. But so the, these pilgrims, it says, for three reasons they stood out from the crowd. So the first one, the pilgrims were clothed with such a raiment that was diverse from the raiment of any that traded in the fair. And so they were considered to be full, so they were dressed different. There was an appearance, there was a physical appearance that was different. And then secondly, it says that they were wondered also not just at how they were dressed, but at their speech. They spoke different. It says, for few could understand what they said. They spoke the language of Canaan. Uh, but they that kept the fair were the men of this world. And so they seemed as barbarians, each to the other. So that, again, the, the, the pilgrims, they were strange because they spoke different. They had a different way of talking. And thirdly, it says, they were kind of looked down upon because they would not buy or, uh, or turn uh, to the vanities that were in the fair. They, it says, they put their fingers in their ears and they cried, turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and look upwards, signifying that their focus was in heaven. So it's just a, a nice telling kind of story to illustrate. Don't be afraid to confess that you're a stranger and a pilgrim. The world might look at you and think, well, you look different. You don't look like you're um, you know, fleshly uh, in, in how you conduct yourself. You know, we see it could be more apparent with women that they look like they're fleshly, revealing a lot of flesh. Uh, we're, we're clothed with a garment uh, and, and with a life that is projecting Christ. We, we're clothed with the garments of the robe of his righteousness. We, we have that, um, we're clothed with that armour of light, the armour of God. So there's that sense where even our, our composure, our, our presentation should be different. I'm not really talking about clothing so much as more that, that the attitude of life, the, that, that we're clothed with humility, for example, it's that conduct, that, that attitude of life. And then secondly, our speech. You know, the world would think it's normal to use F words and whatnot and to curse Christ and to use his name as a swear word to say OMG and such and just use God as if he's some kind of uh, filling in word that they can use like a curse word and demean the name of our precious saviour. The world would think that's routine and normal and, and uh, absolutely fine. But we speak another language. We speak a language of God. And we speak that words that would edify and build up. Words of comfort, words of scripture, words of love. And then thirdly, we see that these pilgrims, they wouldn't buy into all the, all the wares, all the, the carelessness, the vanity, the emptiness of the world. They, they weren't caught up in all the trappings of what the merchandisers at the fair were offering but they said that they want to turn their eyes away from beholding vanity and to rather have their focus on the things of heaven. And it's the same for you and me, brothers and sisters, as strangers and pilgrims. Let's confess that we are such and let's conduct ourselves as such for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your word shows us how uh, that we ought to be different from the world as Noah was, as Abraham, as Moses, as Daniel, as the three Hebrew children. Lord, as many others men and women, through that word of God, through Hebrews 11 and through your word, Lord, we see that recurring theme and we see through church history too, Lord, of the uh, faithful church that soldiered on despite much falsehood and the false regime of, of the Roman Catholic Church and uh, other falsehoods, Lord, that the, the faithful few, the faithful remnant soldiered on as faithful pilgrims and strangers. Lord, help us to to not be ashamed of the cross, to not be ashamed of you, our Lord. Uh, and Lord, we know that you will not be ashamed of us, that we will confess that we're strangers and pilgrims. We'll confess we belong to you. 
that we will confess that we are saved by your saving power. We'll confess that we know you as our Saviour and Lord and we'll confess our faith before men. And give us the grace to, Lord, tactfully, wisely, with wisdom, that we might lead others too to join our number and to be strangers and pilgrims in that walk of faith. Lord, we thank you that it's all only entirely by your grace that we would even have the opportunity to know this saving grace of God. We thank you for it and we praise you, Lord. Help us to live accordingly unto your praise. Lord, give each one strength in these days ahead for whatever faces us that we will not shy away. We will be willing to stand up and be counted and to be strong in that faith that you grant us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.